Hey, good morning. Glad to, to be here. Happy, uh, happy Merry Christmas. And this is our, our last, as Brandon was saying, our last Sunday in the round. And as he said, I want to I say the same and uh, just really grateful for our production and our, our musicians and our worship leaders uh, for all that they do. This is not easy. This is a lot of work. And uh, our properties and service teams that comes in and flips the room. This room doesn't stay set up like this all week long. Uh, there's work that goes on, and so just give them a big round of applause. Say thank you. They do a hard, a good job. So that being said, let's get down to brass tacks, and I think my uh, my kids are going to help me out with this one. Who is excited about gifts, presents? Yes, right. Thank you. Honesty, people. Honesty, right there. A children will lead us. Honesty. Yeah. So we're excited about gifts. That's okay. Doesn't need to be the most important thing, but it's okay to be excited about gifts. And the thing about, and maybe some of you are like me, uh, when you buy something new or when you want to ask for something, does anybody do research to make sure they're getting like the best thing they can get? Anybody researchers of the stuff? Yeah. Yeah, you, you dig in. I think one of the things I want to avoid when I get something is I want to make sure that like the best and the brightest isn't going to be obsolete in three months. So like I want to make sure that like this is really the thing, and, or do I need to wait for three months to get like the whatever it is that's coming out next? And we do this with everything, right? Like isn't this what dating is? Dating's like market research. It's like, are you the best version that I? Are you are you optimal for me, or is there another one coming along later that is better? And can I convince you that I am the best version that you could possibly hope for? as well. Uh, Yes, dating. God, I don't miss that. That's what online dating has become, right? You like swipe and people just keep swiping because on the next picture might be somebody who looks better or is a better fit or whatever and just keep swiping and you never settle down on any one person. Uh, We do this in uh, in hanging out with people, right? Commitment's a big problem because you're like, oh man, they've asked us to go have dinner, but... Maybe something better will come along, or maybe they'll cancel. That's the other. For the introvert, that's the, that's the better option, is the, is the canceled plans. Uh, I have a friend that says their favorite version of plans are the canceled plans, and I'm like, I get that. I understand that. We're always looking for the best version of the thing that we can hope for. And that's why when we stand here on Sunday mornings, or, and we tell you that Jesus is the best possible king you could have. He's the best ruler. We meet that with a little bit of skepticism because you mean to tell me in 2,000 years there hadn't been an upgrade? You mean in 2,000 years we don't have like a Jesus 2.0? I'm sure there's a book somewhere. You mean to tell me there's not some... Jesus didn't even have the internet. He's not connected to Wi-Fi. How in the world? He's not 5G Jesus. There's another book. There, there, there's got to be an upgraded version. And what I'm here to tell you today is that by looking at the story of the wise men, and what we're going to do is we're going to journey with the wise men in navigating the relationships between uh, two different kings. One is Jesus, obviously, and the other one is King Herod. And Herod's going to kind of be a foil for us. He's going to be a stand-in for everything that rules our lives, everything that dominates us, every other choice we have for a ruler, and see that Jesus really is the best version of a king that we can have. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And the first thing I want you to see about Jesus is that he is secure. One of the things that makes Jesus a great king for our lives, even today, is that he is secure. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So there's a lot of speculation about who these wise men were. One of the things we say is there's three of them. We don't know that for sure. There's more than one. Probably it says men, not man. But it could have been a whole group of them. And we know they come from the east. The east could have been anything. could have been modern-day Iran, Iraq, maybe Arabia, the gifts that they bring from uh, with them. 
uh, were connected to Arabia in some sense, but we know they come from the east, and we know that they're Gentiles. We know these are not Jewish uh, uh, people seeking out this king of the Jews, uh, which is interesting that they call him king of the Jews, and I'm pretty sure, at least in Matthew's gospel, the only people that call him king of the Jews are Gentiles, which again is an interesting point that I think Matthew is trying to make. But they follow this star, right? They're astronomers in some sense. Astrologers probably is a better title. They were holy men of some kind. They worked in divination. They worked in prophecy. They worked in astrology, uh, dream interpretation, all sorts of stuff like that. And they noticed this star in the sky. Now, we don't really know what this star was. It could be a comet, although that's probably a little late to be Halley's Comet. It could be a conjunction of planets of Jupiter, Saturn, inside the Pisces constellation, uh, which uh, I don't know how much you know about the Zodiac, and if you're in a Baptist church, probably shouldn't admit that you know anything about it. But Pisces is the, uh, is the last sign in the Zodiac. It's the last one. I didn't know that until this week, so don't like come get me. And so Jupiter, Saturn, inside of Pisces, uh, Jupiter is the planet of kings, Saturn is the planet of the West, and Pisces is the last sign of the Zodiac. The way that the uh, wise men may have interpreted such a constellation, such a setup in the sky, is that a king, Jupiter, was born in the West, Saturn, for the end of days, Pisces. And so that's maybe what drove them. We don't know that, but that's one way to interpret what's going on. Could have also just been a supernova. Chinese astronomers noticed that there was a, a nova that appeared in the sky for about 70 days, uh, around 4 or 5 BC. And then it is perfectly normal to say that maybe this is just something God put in the sky for something specific. I mean, the birth of his son is kind of a big deal. Putting a light in the sky that behaves in all the ways that it behaves would have to be miraculous. There's not any constellation or anything that does all the things this star does. It doesn't fit all the box, checks all the boxes. Regardless, one of the things we do know about the Magi for sure, these guys ask a lot of questions. They're question askers. The thing that drove them across deserts, out of their homeland, this wasn't a day trip. This was a long journey with a massive retinue of people. And they were seeking answers to questions. They had questions. They wind up in Jerusalem because they have questions that they need answering. And they're asking scientific questions. Now, again, their conclusions aren't scientific, but their questions are. Their observations are based on empirical evidence. They're noticing something in the sky. They're asking spiritual questions. Is God trying to tell us something? Are the heavens telling us something? They're asking political questions. Who is this king? A king is born. And even then, their understanding of what's going on is not that far off from the truth. They understand that something that is happening in the heavens is having an effect on what happens on the earth. And you're like, oh, well, Travis, that's astrology. No, that's astronomy. The, the moon creates the tides, right? That is something that happens in the heavens that affects how we live on earth. You'll go outside and it will be bright and sunny. You know why? Because there's a sun. We're not doing this. This is real basic, y'all. I ain't a scientist. But something that happens in the heavens is affecting life here on earth. There's even some scientists now that say that the gravity of other planets has affected and will affect our axis, our climate. And so these guys are, are right in saying things that happen in the heavens affect life here on earth. And so if you are somebody who asks questions, if you're somebody that needs to understand cognitively before you can begin to take steps of faith, you're in good company. You're with the Magi. You're right there in the retinue going with them. They are asking questions. The difference perhaps between yourself and these men is that they asked questions believing that there was an answer. Believing in an answer. They understood that the physical and the metaphysical were more related than we want to admit, even if their conclusions were wrong. And remember, both Christians and 
Empiricists would say their conclusions are wrong. Neither group likes astrology. But they still are asking questions. And they still acknowledge that the physical world and the spiritual world are very closely related. The Magi just make one fatal mistake in their journey. They go to the wrong person to get answers. They go to the wrong person to get answers. They go to a guy named Herod. Herod the Great. And he was great. He did a lot of great things. He was a genius politically. The dude switched parties after losing and not only managed to keep his life, he got promoted. That's skill. He fought with Antony, you know, Antony and Cleopatra. He fought on Antony's side, and when Augustus crushed him, Herod went to him and was like, hey, man, sorry, I was wrong. Please forgive me. And Herod, Augustus is like, I like you. You can go rule Judea. Diplomatically, militarily, he was very successful. He built tons of stuff. The temple is one of them. Herod was an amazing person, but he was also incredibly insecure and incredibly ruthless. He was married to 10 different women, all at the same time. One of them he had executed. Two of her sons he had executed. Another one of his sons he had executed. The fortresses that he built were largely political prisons to hold his enemies. He's an incredibly insecure man. And they come to him with this question, where's this newborn king? What makes this question a bad question is who they ask the question of. It's not that Herod can't give them the right answer. We know that he can. We find out later that he gives the right answer. He gets his scribes and finds out it's in Bethlehem. But he's not doing that to help the Magi. He's doing that to help himself. He gives answers with ulterior motives, wrong conclusions. He wants to follow the wise men so that he can shut down this new king. And this is what happens to us when we take our questions, our ultimate questions, to things that aren't designed to answer ultimate questions. So things about life, life's purpose, uh, significance, uh, importance of existence, meaning. When you take those questions to entities that aren't designed to answer those questions, you will not get the right answers. Look, science can give you really great answers. And I'm particularly worried that some of you might hear, oh, here's one of those sermons where people just bash on science. Not at all. I think science is amazing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. But what if it doesn't paint the whole picture? What if living your life completely based on empiricism is just as foolish as me living my life completely based on the spiritual world? What if I said I don't believe in gravity? You might try to convince me, but probably the best thing you could do is be like, Travis... Allow me to introduce you to my roof. Take a step. I will learn about gravity. One day you'll meet up with gravity. Travis, you're meeting up with gravity now, I guess, technically. And I would say the same thing. You may not be able to observe the Lord with your own eyes, but that will change one day. You will have empirical evidence one day that God definitely exists. I believe that. What if empiricism, what if the physical and the metaphysical are much more closely related than we think? That's what makes science, when it's the only place to go for answers, what makes it incomplete and insecure. It's not that science is bad. It's that it's constantly changing. Now again, I know that science doesn't actually change. Facts are facts. They don't change necessarily. Gravity doesn't change. The laws of physics, they're called laws for a reason, right? They shouldn't change. I think there's Star Trek episodes about things where they do, but again, that's science fiction. But there are things that we thought were fact, and they're no longer fact. Newtonian physics were revolutionary. And some, in some ways, again, I'm super not a scientist, so if I'm wrong here, you can send me an email. But in some ways, they've been adjusted and even corrected by Einsteinian physics, but Einstein himself was even wrong about stuff. Einstein said that the, the, the universe was static and not changing. We know that's not true. The universe is dynamic. It's constantly expanding. Einstein was wrong. Does that make me smarter than Einstein? I'll leave that up to you. You can make that choice. And all of this is great. Praise God for discovery. 
Praise God that we don't use leeches in medicine anymore. And I got was corrected afterwards that actually leeches are used sometimes for wound care. So we're not there yet. <laughs> but we're not like, oh, you have a headache. Here's a good bloodletting. Things have changed. We don't use phrenology anymore, which is the study of lumps in your head to determine what your character is. I don't understand it, but it was science fact for a while. It was very in vogue. And this is why Jesus is a more secure king than anything else, because Jesus doesn't change. You know what Jesus and science have in common besides the fact that Jesus created it? Neither one of them is trying to prove themselves to you. Think about it. Science is fact, whether you believe it or not. There could be alien life on another planet somewhere else, and they exist whether they are observable or not. They are fact, whether you believe they are fact or not. The same is true for Jesus. He is king, whether you acknowledge him as king or not. He's king. He's ruler. And you know what? He wants you to believe in him, not for his sake. Your belief or lack of belief in his kingship neither diminishes nor increases his dominance. He wants you to believe in him for your sake, not his. He died for you so that you could be reconciled to the fact of your own brokenness and reconciled to the fact of your own need for your creator. And in the same way, science is the same. It's not trying to prove itself to you. It just is. So what would I say to someone asking questions? The church has responded differently over the centuries, right? We have not so great a history of people asking questions and us responding in a gracious and compassionate manner. I would say keep asking questions. Don't stop asking questions. I hope that right or, or frail this attempt is at foray into scientific discussion from the pulpit. I hope that you see a church that's willing to engage on those subjects and that would love to have a conversation with you about that, would like to talk to you about that, would like to be even pointed to resources where I could learn more because, frankly, I want to learn more. But this isn't just a safe place for you to ask your factual questions. It's a place for you to ask your emotional questions, your questions about sexuality, your questions about life. It's a safe place to ask any questions because we believe in a God of grace and we believe in a God who welcomes people who ask questions and he's been doing it since his birthday. Welcoming people who ask questions. But here's what I would ask you to do. I would ask you to take a, a, a page out of the Magi's book and include Jesus in your question asking. Now you may or may not believe in him, your faith may be weak, but I think it is worthwhile for you to at least acknowledge the fact that Jesus may exist. There is a possibility that that is true. And if that's the case, acknowledging him in prayer is not the worst thing in the world. You could say, Jesus, I do not believe, but I want to. Or, Jesus, I do not believe, but I want to be a good empiricist. I want to respond to you. I want to, if you exist, I want to, I want to exist in a world where, where I'm embracing what is factual. And so make yourself known to me. Reveal yourself to me. Show yourself to me. There's a story in the Gospels that's later on in Jesus' life where uh, uh, they're coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration and uh, Jesus and his disciples come upon a, a boy who's possessed by a demon and his father. And Jesus goes to cast out the, the demon, but before he does, he says to the man, he says, do you believe I can do this? And the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. And that is a valid prayer. That is a prayer of the doubter. That is the prayer of the questioner. That is the prayer when you don't know what else to pray, when you're struggling with faith. Dude, if you need a one-sentence prayer, I believe, help my unbelief, that's a childlike faith question, right? Let that be your prayer. Because at some point, you have to cross the threshold into faith. That's true. So let's talk about that right now. Let's talk about the fact that Jesus isn't just uh, secure. He's promised we're promised Jesus. Look at verse 5 of chapter 2. It says, They told him, the scribes, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. 
For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in, warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So the Magi are told exactly where to go, to Bethlehem, by quoting a prophecy that's from Micah 5.2, with a little bit of 2 Samuel 5.2 sprinkled in. And they're told where to go. They're told to go to Bethlehem. And this king, this Herod, tells them, and let me know where he is so I can go and worship him too. And we know that that's not really what he wanted to do. We know that's the case. And what's really interesting about this, and I didn't know this until I had read it this week, I'd read about it this week, is that there are layers of Old Testament uh, allusions throughout. There are Old Testament shout-outs, Easter eggs, callbacks, whatever you want to call it throughout this story, and they're layered on top of each other. You can't just uh, set a couple verses to it. It's, they're layered. And so I want to walk through a few of these. One is from Numbers. It's from Numbers 22 to 24. You don't have to look it up. It's far too long. But there's a story of uh, Israel's wandering in the wilderness. God's people, his chosen people, his chosen ones, are wandering through the desert. And there's a king who's afraid of them. And so he calls a man named Balaam, who's a holy man, prophet, kind of mystical dude, to curse Israel. And so Balak, the king, hires Balaam uh, to go up on a mountain and curse them. And after an episode with the talking donkey, which, yes, think Shrek, because I can't read that passage anymore without hearing Eddie Murphy. <laughs> he goes up on a mountain and he goes to curse them. And three times he does this. And all three times he doesn't curse them, he blesses them. And Balak is just irritated, irate. And he's like, I can't help it. This is God's work. God is just letting blessing come out of my mouth. And look at what happens in the story of Jesus. God's chosen one is pursued by an, uh, an unrighteous king who hires or wants to hire, wants to enlist the aid of Gentile holy men to curse by ratting out the location of God's chosen one. And instead, what do they wind up doing? They bless him with gifts three times. It's the same story. But it gets better. In Moses, in the story of Moses, some of y'all know this story, uh, Moses was born in Egypt in a time where the Pharaoh, and again, a Gentile king who's very insecure, is afraid of the growing Israelite population, and so he decides to have all male children killed. And Moses is saved through a combination of the work of his mom, his sister, and Pharaoh's daughter. Again, a Gentile coming to the rescue and blessing the life of God's chosen deliverer. Oh, and Moses delivers people from enslavement, and Jesus does too. He just delivers them from enslavement to sin. Same way, in 2 Samuel, uh, sorry, not 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, King Solomon is visited by a bunch of kings. So he's, King Solomon is, is in charge of the golden age of Israel. He's the wisest king to ever live. And all these kings come to him, and they visit him. And one of the rulers that visit isn't a king at all. It's a queen. It's the queen of Sheba. And the queen of Sheba comes and asks him all these questions. And when he passes the test, she gives him a bunch of gifts. You know what she gives him? Gold and spices, of which would have included frankincense and myrrh. And so Jesus is visited by Gentile magi, who we call sometimes kings. And he's given gifts by them. And what's cool is he doesn't even have to answer any questions because he is the answer to their question. They want to know where is the king of the Jews. And they find him. He's the answer. It's a really amazing story. And Jesus even points it out in uh, Matthew 12, 42, same book that we're in now. He says, uh, uh, someone greater than Solomon is here. Like he even references it. Now, what's the point of all this? Why am I going down this wonderful trip that you're like, oh, this is interesting, Travis, neat. So I want you to look at Herod. Herod is not promised or foretold by anything. 
Herod, there's no prophecy that points to him. There's no Old Testament. Herod wasn't even a Jew ethnically. He was an Idumean. He's appointed to be king of the Jews because he got in good with Augustus. That's why. And so whenever somebody comes along that's the son of David, who has legitimate claim to the throne, Herod gets very, very nervous. Very, very nervous. I want you to think about this. Think about the things that rule your life, that run your day-to-day existence. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's the stuff you have, the quest for more stuff. Your neighborhood, your business, your work, your family. Were they promised by anybody? Are there centuries of prophecy foretelling of the coming of the, the iPhone? The world would like to think that, like you to think that there is. They want you to think that your happiness is the long promised thing, the thing that's been offered to you forever. And now we live in a golden age where you can have all the happiness that you want, and anything that's a threat to your happiness is the, is the pretender to the king. Whatever makes you happy needs to be ruling your life. But here's the thing. It's just Herod. Those are just Herod. Whatever it is, it's Herod. Idols are just Herod. That's what Herod was. He was a man trying to be God. And the things in your life that run your life that aren't Jesus are just pretenders to the throne. That's all they are. And this Christmas, just like the the wise men had a messenger appear to them in a dream, some of you may be asleep, so this might be appearing as a dream. (laughs) But let me be a messenger from the Lord for just a couple seconds. You don't have to go back to that king. You can go back a different way. Repentance is literally changing direction. That's what the wise men do. They repent and they change direction. They meet the king and they go a different way. You came in here enslaved to one thing. Maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's something else. You don't have to go out the same way. This can be a different place. This can be your Bethlehem. This can be meeting the baby lying in the manger, which we know much later, but whatever. It's a cool picture. You can go back the other way. You can go back a different way. You don't have to go back to that pretender. And every day you can choose, I'm going to choose the one who died for me. Because he's come to set you free. Now, how do we know this? Well, we know that Jesus is merciful. We know he's merciful. Look at verse 16. Jesus is merciful. That's what makes him a better king. Verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. Funny, the guy that was trying to trick the wise men gets mad when he himself is tricked. Became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. This is the the reality check portion of the Christmas story. This is the part where where the, the gospel writer reminds you that just because the Messiah has appeared doesn't mean that evil still doesn't exist. And on some days, evil even seems to be winning. Seems to be prevalent. I mean, is there anything more tragic than the death of multiple small children? We don't know how many kids were killed. Somewhere between 20 and 50. If it happened in our cities, it would be akin to how we react when school shootings happen. Just devastating. And this is Herod's last great terrible thing that he does in Scripture. King who slaughters innocents. That's how he handles rebellion. It's called the massacre of the innocents. That's what's called on the church calendar. It's acknowledged a couple days after uh, Christmas Day. Let me ask you this. You might be saying to me, Travis, how is this merciful? You say Jesus is merciful. How does he allow for the slaughter of innocent children? What's more is he sends a message to Joseph, the caretaker for his own son, to get out of there, but he doesn't send that to any other dads? He doesn't CC anybody else on that email? Why doesn't any other dad get to take their kid out of Bethlehem? Why does that happen? Explain how God is merciful in light of that. And I'm going to give you the most unsatisfying answer I can. I don't know. I don't know why he doesn't do that. I have no idea. I wish he had. 
But I'm not God. I'm not wise like he is. And I think there's a place to grieve in this story because this is the place where God reminds us that the gospel is good news because there is bad news. The gospel, the sacrifice of Jesus is good news because there's bad news. And might I remind you that that baby in a manger does eventually die. It just wasn't his time yet. And so all of the children are slaughtered, including God's own son. But he dies for you and he dies for me. The massacre of the innocents is a reminder that we need mercy and we can't expect that mercy from each other. We need someone else to come, someone from outside this sin-infested cluster life that we live and deliver us. And it's Jesus Christ, the God-man, who sacrifices his life, is resurrected, and extends to us a new life. Because you see what Herod does to rebels is what every other king does to rebels. You kill them, you eliminate them, you get rid of them. You know what God does to rebels? He dies for them. He dies in their place. Do you see the difference between every ruler you have and every ruler and Jesus? Another thing the massacre of the innocents tells us is that your idols won't just kill you. They'll kill your children too. The things that you worship, the things that you follow, you will teach your children to follow, and your children will teach their children to follow. And we will pass it on and on and on. The thing, the idol, the pretender to the throne that uses you up and casts you aside and then goes on will do the same things to our kids. The idols you worship are the same things that you will put in front of your children, and they will learn whether it's success, whether it's affirmation, whether it's uh, uh, lust, whether it's whatever it is. But you can stop it. You can go back a different way. You can intervene. You can listen to the voice of the Lord, and you can go back a different way. And you can choose by following Jesus, by believing in him and trusting him, not just today, but every day of your life, that he's going to be Lord and he's going to be king. And you can be the person that maybe changes the course, not just of your own life, but every life that comes after you in your family line. Think about that. You can change it. You can start with you today. Jesus is a secure king who is incredibly merciful. And he's the one who's been promised to us and he's the best king you could hope for. Then, 2,000 years later, and however many long eternity is, the same. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son showing us what real kingship is. Thank you for letting us go on a journey with these wise men who really were wise to come and seek out a king. I pray that we would be willing to journey today and tomorrow and forever seeking the one who died for us. We pray this in your name. Amen.